Thank you. So to start with, I'd like to recognise that no matter where we are in this virtual world of Zoom, that we are all on Indigenous land. And I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We, as the Doctors' Union, have called this forum to discuss the critical issue of the wages freeze, which is on the cards for all public sector workers. It's been mentioned in various newsletters, it's been in the newspapers, it's been discussed in numerous fora. We, as your union, are deeply disappointed that the New South Wales government, I should say the New South Wales Liberal government, has decided to press ahead with trying to freeze our wages and conditions. And I think these words I've used before, it's a, frankly a slap in the face to all essential workers, including doctors who have been working tirelessly throughout this pandemic, sometimes at risk for their own health and safety. And as we've seen in Victoria, healthcare workers are getting this disease. None have died in Australia as yet, but at our COVID uh, webinar some uh, weeks ago, there was a long list of healthcare workers in other countries who had died as a result of this virus. So the government's move, I think, makes it fairly clear that they're not, they don't want to recognise the work. But from an economic viewpoint, you know, the budget is not the economy and it has no sound economic rationale. It is Keynesian economics, but Keynesian economics has been shown demonstrably to be the case. And if the economy can be pushed along in a time of COVID, with public sector expenditure, then it actually in fact helps the entire economy. Business people don't get that. And you should read Paul Krugman's, Paul Krugman's op-ed in the New York Times two days ago, where he makes that point fairly strongly. So let's re reflect on the history of this. The wages freeze was voted down in parliament. It does not have broad public support. It probably has the support of the right wing of the Liberal Party and uh, the big business interest that the Liberal Party supports. The wages freeze is inconsistent with what has been happening in other states and countries. The Victorian government has ruled it out. And countries like France have given health workers historic pay rises during this pandemic. So what's the government doing now? It's trying it on through the Industrial Relations Commission. So we're opposed to this. The union movement is opposed to this. And econ economists to understand what it means are opposed to it. So we've joined forces as your union with Union New South Wales and other relevant unions for us, including the nurses, the HSU and the Public Services Union, to put evidence before the Commission to say this makes no economic sense and politically it's not the right thing to do for the people who've been putting their lives on the line for you, the government and the public. So we spent nine days over the past two months presenting our evidence, and that's mainly been Andrew Holland. So thank you, Andrew, for that. And we don't have an answer as yet, and maybe we'll get an answer shortly. So basically, bottom line, we don't want this freeze to go ahead, as it's a dangerous precedent to accept. It's wrong economically, and the long-term effects, particularly on junior doctors, are enormous. If you read the op-eds and do the numbers, the long-term effect on workers is cumulative, it's additive, and it's very deeply dark. So what are we doing tonight? The purpose of tonight is to give you an overview of the case that we, the union movement, and you and us, your union, ran in the Industrial Relations Commission. We'll hear a little bit about the expert economic advice underpinning the case to oppose the wages freeze. We'll hear from uh, the New South Wales Labor opposition on their position on the wages freeze and the wages policy. And lastly, to let you know how you can support the campaign to stop the wage freeze. So the meeting will be recorded. The chat uh, comments won't be recorded and will be available on the website a little while after the meeting. So that's it from me for the moment. So I'd like to hand over to my co-chair, Dr. Raj Ubeja, to introduce himself. Raj, say hello. Hi uh, all. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the co-chair of the Asimov Doctors and Training Committee. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of, of the land of which I'm on today, the Camaragal people of the Eora tribe. Um, stopping this wage freeze is so important, particularly for doctors in training. Um, doctors in training in New South Wales have some of the poorest working conditions across Australia. And as a result of nine years of current wages policy, um, junior doctors in New South Wales have 
some of the worst quali- uh, conditions and there's just significant inequality. As doctors in training, we have big study that's the payoff for those of us in training programs and a whole range of training fees for courses, college fees, exams, relocation, needing to move accommodation as you move to different training positions. For, for we've, we've surveyed some of our trainees and, and some of them have said the cost of some of their fees are over $10,000 a year. And those fees will continue to increase next year. A wage fair freeze is unfair for doctors in training who have worked tirelessly during the pandemic. So before we start and move on, I'd just like to go through some basic housekeeping rules. Um, please remember to keep on mute. It's, it's great to see all of you here. If you'd like to unmute, that would be fantastic. Uh, you know, un, I mean, put your, your camera on so we can see you. That would be fantastic. Um, and if you want to say any something, please just put some comments in the, the questions box, um, the comments in the chat, and then we'll try and get to them later on. And if we don't get around to answering everything tonight, um, we will get back to you after the meeting. Back to you, Tony. Thanks very much, Raz. Our first speaker is Adam Searle, who is the uh, leader of the opposition in the Legislative Council, that's the upper house, and shadow minister for industrial relations. And I met uh, Adam at the nurses' Christmas party and was impressed by his grasp of politics, his grasp of the law, um, and in the position he holds as shadow minister of industrial relations, if Labor was elected, I suspect we'd be having conversations. Um, you're on mute. So, Adam, over to you. Okay, thanks, Tony, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, as a number of you will know, before I entered Parliament, I practised law as a barrister, mainly practising in the industrial and employment field, mainly for unions and their members and applicants. And one of the cases I did in the State Commission was the uh, pay equity case for childcare workers. Uh, I, I've been a barrister for two decades. Before I was a barrister, I was the Chief of Staff to Jeff Shaw when he was the Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations here in New South Wales, when we brought into force and effect the 1996 Industrial Relations Act before the wage for, uh, before the wage cap, the wages policy was put into place. Um, now, uh, obviously, so I've got some exposure to industrial matters. Um, I'm a traditionalist. I think there should be a, a broad discretion in industrial tribunals so that workers can bring forward their cases and have them dealt with on their merits. After the 21 election wipeout here in New South Wales, when the O'Farrell government put in place the legislation that has enabled the 2.5% wage cap to be put in place, Labor fought that tooth and nail in the parliament. And it's just a matter of record that our party platform commits the Labor Party to uh, scrap the cap at some point when we get back into government. So that's, that's our history. That's, our, uh, that's where we see these things. Um, obviously, in the pandemic, where there was a lot of talk about the government putting in place what they called a pay freeze for one year, but we say it's a pay cut. That might sound like semantics, but it's a cut because you miss out on any increase in the current year and you never catch up. It's not like you then can say, well, next year we'll get 5% or ask for 5% and you make up for what you've lost. You always lose uh, the year in which the pause or freeze is put in place. And there's been a lot of modelling about how much an average worker in the public sector will lose over their lifetime. It could be as high as $100,000. Uh, and of course, it will have a, a significant impact on, on their retirement incomes as well. So we say it's a pay cut, but also because although economists have said that there's little to no inflation, in fact, there is deflation, a lot of that is because of the free childcare and an assumption that you know, rents are falling uh, because there's high vacancy rate. But the truth is, if you're a commercial lessee with a current lease, landlords, the evidence is pretty clear, are not willingly reducing rent. If you're a, a, a renter, um, your landlord is not necessarily dropping your rent during the, during the lifetime of your current tenancy. Uh, like many of you, I go to the supermarket regularly and shop for my family. Uh, prices there have in fact gone up over the last six months. They haven't gone down. So inflation is still eating away at people's wages and conditions. And if there's no increase in your salary, there will be a reduction in the amount of goods and services you can buy 
out of your income. So that is another way to say there is a cut. So for these reasons, uh, the Labor Party opposed the government's so-called freeze, the 0% wage increase, and I moved uh, in the upper house uh, to disallow the regulation that they made under the legislation to try and bring this into force and effect. And all non-government parties across the political spectrum from left to right joined with us and voted that down, which is why the matter is now moved to the Industrial Relations Commission. And of course, when we did that, there was a lot of pressure put on us about, well, look, you know, public sector workers have a job. Lots of people have lost theirs or they've lost income. Shouldn't they just be grateful? Uh, and there was this attempt even to look at maybe only freezing the wages of some public sector workers, having a deserving and not deserving uh, groups of workers, deserving or so-called frontline workers, maybe like yourselves who should get an increase and the implicitly undeserving so-called backroom workers who, you know, implicitly don't do any work according to the government's perception of the public sector, which we all know is, is nonsense because we know, yes, frontline workers are vital and important, but without the cleaners keeping your hospitals clean, the whole system falls down. And it's the same with other non frontline or operational workers who actually do the work that enables, um, you know, uh, everybody else to do their work. So, um, but also there was this notion that you should be just grateful to have a job. Uh, some people in the public sector are relatively well paid uh, compared to the wider community. A number of people even said, look, uh, in this circumstances, I don't feel we should be getting a pay rise um, because of that. But the issue isn't about whether public sector workers deserve or don't deserve a pay rise or whether they are paid above average wages or not. The truth that we advocated was a simple economic truth. The government says, well, we're going to save $3 billion and we're going to put this into infrastructure and generate ac economic activity and jobs. The government knows that the uh, infrastructure workforce is already overcommitted. Throwing kerosene on the bonfire won't produce more economic outcomes because their ability to actually increase the amount of infrastructure being built in New South Wales has pretty much reached limitations. Um, and so an extra three billion over the next three years, which is what they said they would save through not having uh, wages being increased in the public sector um, is a nonsense because you won't get that economic act outcome. And independent economic modelling done by the Australia Institute looked at modelling about how many new jobs would be created uh, through this so-called infrastructure spend and how many jobs would be created if the expected public sector wage rises went forward. And they found that there was an extra 1,100 full-time equivalent jobs that would be created right across New South Wales, across every local economy through public sector wage rises rather than infrastructure. And why? Because this 2.5% would largely be spent wherever public sector workers are in every town, village and suburb, in every location across New South Wales, in every shopping centre and every high street. And that additional spend, particularly in the recession and the pandemic, is actually needed to underpin the existing and create new private sector jobs. So this is not about saying perhaps already relatively well-paid public servants deserve a rise because they do a good job, although I think that's true. It's straightforward economics. This pay rise should go through for the greater good of the whole economy and to drive the creation of jobs in the private sector and even to keep the jobs that are existing there, but which are under threat because of low economic activity. So we said, look, it's not about the deserving and the undeserving workers or whether public servants broadly speaking, deserve a pay rise. This is about making sure that the tide rises floating all boats, uh, if, I, if I can use that sort of mixed metaphor. So that was the position we took early, clearly and resolutely, and we believe the community uh, supports that. So I'm happy to Thank take- you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. I think we're gonna do questions at the end. Um, so if anyone's got any specific questions for Adam, put them in the chat right now. He will have to leave very shortly. And I'll try and answer them as best I can. <laughs> yep. 
while we're waiting for see if there's any questions in the chat, let's move to um, <clears throat> Luke Forsyth, who's a principal at uh, Paul Payne, the lawyers that both uh, the state union and the federal union have used for many years. Excellent service. We do have uh, an agreement with them that members get um, better rates and free initial consultation with Hall Payne. Sounds like a commercial, doesn't it? So Luke, you're ready to roll? I am, thanks Tony. Over um, to you. That was an excellent commercial, I appreciate it. Um, so we acted for Asmoc New South Wales in the um, proceedings which were, were heard. These proceedings came about um, by a range of different unions acting for public sector workers filing applications for new awards or variations to their existing awards, um, seeking um, the 2.5 percent wage, uh, the 2.5 percent wage increase, which was the maximum allowable under the state government wages policy regulation. The industrial commission decided. Um, for reasons which frankly are still beyond me, uh, to amalgamate 40 something of those applications and try and hear them over two days. That was unsurprisingly unsuccessful. Now, these um, proceedings, um, the central question that the Commission needs to determine, um, and it was the central question obviously in these applications, was whether the award of increases sought by unions, um, whether that was um, appropriate um, and that requires the Commission looking at, uh, at whether um, on the evidence there's a proper and proportionate balance between the entitlements afforded to the employees and the interests of employers. The difficulty that um, unions have um, had since the um, Conservative government was elected and introduced the wages policy is that that, that policy has absolutely constrained the capacity of unions to bargain for uh, um, their members um, and it's constrained it because wage, wage costs are capped at 2.5% per annum. So therefore, if you seek a wage rise, you can't seek a wage rise more than 2.5%. Than if you do, you've got to be able to demonstrate a range of different savings um, or reductions in, in employee related costs. So that is, you lose other conditions. Um, the effect of that has been essentially an atrophying of bargaining in this state um, because plainly it's in the best interests of public sector workers to take the 2.5% um, each year um, that the government has traditionally offered. That's been described um, by the Commission in the past as a quid pro quo. Um, and one of the arguments that ASMOV and the other unions that um, were involved in the case that we ran, which was the public sector a public Service Association, the Health Services Union and the Nurses and Midwives Association of New South Wales was it was just simply unfair and unjust for the government to depart from this quid pro quo, both because the state of New South Wales has had the benefit of the restraint on wages and conditions it's imposed over the last 10 years. Um, uh, and because those restraints will continue to operate into the future regardless of the economic fortunes of the state. That is, um, a wage freeze now is going to echo and magnify over the years. Um, central to this case and central to the state's argument was it's an economic catastrophe, um, we need to do this. It, it was centrally an economic argument and the state bore the onus of proving um, the economic case for no wage increase. Um, perhaps one of the striking features of their case um, was, at least in our view, um, despite express invitations from the Commission on a number of occasions, they failed to provide really any cogent evidence to support this central plank of their case. Um, the economic case for the unions was coordinated by Unions New South Wales and, and, and my comrade and colleague L. Leverington did a um, spectacularly good job on doing that um, for the unions and she's going to talk in more detail about both the, 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 the economic case but also what I actually think um, ironically was the most, the most interesting part of this drop, sort of sometimes dry litigation was how bad the state's case was on that. Um, so I'll leave, um, leave it to L to go into a bit more detail with that. 
one of the um, most um, heartening things about this case was the contribution uh, of ASMOG members to putting uh, to, to evidence that was filed in the case. So we had a range of, um, of uh, doctors, from doctors in training um, to emergency department heads who gave affidavits setting out um, the reasons uh, why doctors in this state are deserving of a pay rise at the moment. Now, um, Raj raised a point which was um, important from the point of view of doctors in training in that doctors in training, um, uh, as, as, as you all either know or, or suspect, are the lowest paid in Australia. Um, and evidence was put on by um, another two doctors in training about um, the conditions that they have, the disparity between them and their colleagues interstate, the effect that has on morale, the, the effect that has on recruitment and retention, um, and the difficulties being so lowly paid has given the exceptionally high costs of training as, as Raj outlined in his introduction. Um, we also had evidence from staff specialists that were talking about their central involvement in um, very important productivity and efficiency measures which have resulted in the state saving enormous you know, um, amounts of money, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars through things such as the implementation of digital patient health records, Premier's priority of improving service levels in hospitals, uh, childhood obesity, um, cutting waiting times to plan surgeries, statewide trauma plans, the, the list went on, the, the extraordinary efforts of, of, of doctors in this state in improving um, health service delivery and health services was um, a core argument for ASMOB about why we were deserving of um, a, a pay rise. And, and then you get to COVID and, and all the doctors that gave evidence were able to give very cogent um, and um, powerful evidence about the effects that COVID has had on health service delivery and, and, and work and work-life balance and um, for, for doctors um, in this state. Um, uh, they are also able to give evidence of the demoralising effect um, that uh, the proposal for a wage freeze had had while they were, uh, I think I'm quoting accurately from one senior staff specialist, we were working our guts out and then got kicked in the guts. So um, it was um, really a fantastic effort by ASMOB members to put forward this evidence. Um, and it was evidence which um, to a very minimal degree um, was challenged by the state, but partly because of the way the proceedings ended up being running, but partly because it wasn't really something you could raise too many issues with. Um, now, uh, the outcome is obviously, we don't know what that is yet. It's very difficult um, to, to assess, um, you know, whether the state's case will be successful and there is no pay rise granted or whether, um, there'll be some degree of success with uh, a form of pay rise, uh, some type of pay rise being awarded. I would tend to uh, the, the view that we, there will be a pay rise awarded. I, I don't think it will be 2.5%, but there are some um, powerful uh, reasons for why one should be. Elle will deal with the economic arguments for why that's the case, but there are also some other helpful things that occurred during the proceedings, in, including the, the, the Fair Work Commission um, uh, providing for pay rises in respect to federal um, awards, which um, their analysis of the economics um, of what is going on at the moment with COVID, um, uh, they, they undertook a very um, detailed analysis of that and um, that will have an impact on the decision. But suffice to say, ASMOV um, uh, ran a very good case, which um, could not have occurred without, um, uh, I think about, we had six doctors at the end of the day who were prepared to put their hand up and, and talk about uh, why they believed it was appropriate for a pay rise. And, and I think that was very effective and powerful evidence. Thanks, Tony. That's, I think, the, the summary I would have. And, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions in chat directly.
Thanks very much, Luke. So um, there was a question from a member to Adam Searle, um, which he's already answered in the chat. The question was, for those of you who are on phones and aren't reading the chat, the question was, is Labor committed to removing the wage freeze legislation? The answer is yes, that's the policy that Labor took to the last election. And it's likely that will remain in the party platform for the future. So our next speaker is Elle Leverington, who's a lawyer. We seem to be being taken over by lawyers from New South Wales who's going to talk about the economics of uh, the case that the union movement has put to the, the commission. Elle, over to you. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so my name's Elle. I work at Unions New South Wales, which is the um, peak body of trade unions in New South Wales. So I had the very great fortune of um, being able to do a lot of coordination in this matter and, and not have to do quite so much evidence, of which there was a lot. Um, I, so I'm going to talk about the economic evidence. It's probably a little bit cheeky to say, but the Industrial Relations Commission was invaded with a bit of propaganda during this matter. Um, and I guess on a really basic level, um, that was the fact that their economic evidence was introduced by two people who didn't write it and who weren't experts on, on the content of it, which is um, problematic in some other ways. But I guess the first is that um, the, the chief economist of New South Wales, Stephen Walters, um, definitely had a bit to do with it, but it came out in evidence that his team had written it for the most part. And then uh, the other witness that introduced some of the economic evidence was Michael Pratt, who's the Secretary of Treasury, um, who, you know, doesn't have any formal education in, in running an economy. And actually it came to light through summonsing some documents that he uh, only um, became the one to introduce that evidence the night before it was filed and actually signed an affidavit that was originally written for someone else, although we never got to the bottom of that. Um, so what I wanted to talk about first was this $3 billion figure that we've seen so much in the media and that we heard about constantly um, throughout this matter. And, you know, the government's saying we're going to save $3 billion by, by implementing this wage freeze. And the thing is, we never, despite trying so many times, as Luke said, we never got to the bottom of that $3 billion figure. The government absolutely refused to give us the underpinnings or the calculation for that number. And we actually couldn't get them to confirm um, the employees on the basis of which that number was calculated. So they wouldn't say whether or not, say, the, the teachers were involved. And, and that's particularly problematic because public sector teachers have their 2021 pay increase already enshrined in their awards. So if the wage freeze goes ahead, their 12 month period won't occur until 2022. So we were like, well, are you factoring in, you know, this significant portion of employees to the calculations. At one point, Michael Pratt, um, who was just not a great witness, um, sort of said that Sydney Trains employees were included in the $3 billion figure. And they couldn't be because Sydney Trains employees are employed in the federal, in the federal sector. So it would be very problematic if the New South Wales government was budgeting for you know, their wage increase. Um, the other issue, one of the other issues with the $3 billion figure was that whilst it was talked about as this amount of money that was immediately available, it's actually a saving that is predicted to be made over three or four years. So it's, it's, it's not fair to, you know, to talk about what can be done with that money now and actually, it, and, and the stimulus value of that money now, when the money won't actually be realized for quite a number of years. Um, as Adam touched on, the government has said that, oh, we're gonna use this $3 billion to, um, to, to do new construction projects and that's how we're going to recover the state from COVID and you know infrastructure is will save the state and and all of these things. There are a lot of issues with this. Um, the first is that the saving by investing in infrastructure is not going to create any jobs or very very few. The Australia Institute did some modelling um, recently and they found that spending a million dollars on construction infrastructure creates 1.2 direct jobs. Um, so I guess through spending money on infrastructure, if we're looking at jobs, actually the implication is that um, 
we will only give more work to people already in the industry. Um, the government also refused to give any confirmation of the projects on which the money would be spent. At one point, um, they kind of re-announced some projects that are already in train and had already been announced um, under the guise of this COVID recovery spending. Um, that was obviously, there were just, there were a lot of holes. Um, another thing that came up throughout this matter was the stimulus value of different types of spending. Obviously, we, the union movement, were saying, you know, wage increase is the best form of stimulating the economy um, during this recession. And it's, it's a recession that will last for a number of years, whereas the government was saying, no, infrastructure projects have the highest fiscal multiplier. And a fiscal multiplier, if anyone's interested, um, is the effect that an increase in fiscal spending will have on a state or country's economic output. So, in, in the context of a recession, actually construction is not that beneficial because it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of time to do, so any value, any money put into the economy is not actually felt for quite a while um, because you know, soil isn't going to be turned immediately by comparison to a wage increase where in the first two weeks or first month when you get your first increased paycheck, you're spending that extra money and it's circulating through the economy right away. Um, and as well as that, construction projects are really capital intensive and um, they, they have what's called leakages and a, a lot of them because you have to pay a lot of tax, there's a lot of um, import involved and then of course companies doing it take profits, um, some of which are offshore, so the money is diluted um, when it is eventually spent. By comparison, as I mentioned, cash stimulus has a really um, immediate effect, particularly when it's in the pockets of low and middle income earners. What our fantastic economic expert, um, Andrew Charlton, who was one of Kevin Rudd's advisors, um, talked about was, you know, if you, if you put money into the pockets of low and middle income er earners, they have what's called a higher marginal propensity to consume, which means that, um, because you've given them some extra money, and particularly in the context of a recession where households have constrained credit, they're going to spend that money straight away and it's going to continue to circulate through the economy kind of straight away. So maybe in, in peacetime, in regular times, where we would look at stimulus values differently in a recession, giving people cash um, is a really good way to both pick the economy up immediately and also affect, sorry, avoid some, um, some much deeper effects down the track. Um, we all learned a word called hysteresis, which is, which is just that um, by reducing immediate economic hardship, you avoid some, some long-term loss. Uh, and the other big value that we pushed upon in the matter was that if you increase public sector wages, there is, in some sectors more than others, but there is a direct increase on private sector wages. So you, you get the stimulus value in the public sector uh, in this instance, you know, 400,000 people. And then the secondary impact is that the cash stimulus um, in the private sector and their um, increased spending. And we also kind of stress that because of travel restrictions, that money will be spent in Australia, if not in New South Wales. Um, so it will have an even higher value. Uh, so look, I, I guess what we stressed what the union stressed throughout this matter was that while, while for, for some people, for higher income earners, of which you know doctors are some, the 2.5% or whatever it is we end up with will just be a bit of extra savings or you know, a, a bit more comfort. But for the majority of public sector workers in New South Wales in this year, in this recession, it, it's really going to facilitate um, ends meeting because in real terms, you look at inflation and I think we spent days talking about the benefits of different methods of measuring inflation and it, it, economics is <laughs> by all accounts is about as um, easy to interpret in, in different ways as the law. Um, but whichever way you look at it, over 12 months, your wages will be worth less if you don't get the increase now. And so, that was, was really um, what we led with. There was chat throughout, um, throughout the matter about maybe saying, oh, well, if we don't give a pay rise to the upper echelons and just to the bottom, and as well as being an administrative burden, and as Adam touched on, really unfair. It, it, it just 
I guess would be impossible to ever catch up on. So we unions push back strongly on that suggestion. Uh, oh, just I think the, the last thing I really wanted to, to, to touch upon about our economic evidence was the affordability of it. The government um, tried from a few different angles to just say, oh, we can't afford it, or oh, it will be irresponsible, or oh, this is already our debt, you know, you're trying to make us go into more debt. Um, but actually, the New South government, New South Wales government is in a, a really good fiscal position, particularly by comparison to um, other states. And the anticipated CPI, or sorry, the anticipated um, inflation drop was actually not not nearly as bad as as um, the government had predicted, which was which was good. I think they've had a very negative outlook, and and it's not quite as bad as they as they thought. Um, and actually, I just want to mention something that came to light just after we finished the matter, which was a shame because it would have been a good help. Um, was that the governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, gave evidence for the Federal um, House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics two days after we finished. And he talked about Australia's public finances being in really strong shape, all of the states having great borrowing capacity, that not spending now will do further damage to the economy. Um, interest rates are the lowest they've been since, since Federation and that you know, we need to be actively putting more money through the economy immediately. So look, that was, that was the approach that, that unions took. It's that real people need money in their pocket that is the most important thing to the state and the and the national economy um, right now and so we really look i thought that the union matter was was very convincing and we managed to poke a lot of holes in what the government put forward so as luke mentioned um we don't know when we will get a decision or or what it will be they indicated when we finished on the 12th of august that they were very busy for 12 weeks Another, a similar matter involving um, some different unions, but on the essentially the same issue, um, I started actually the day after we finished and is scheduled to finish the first week of October. So I would anticipate a decision mid to late October or after that. And um, yeah, I, I also anticipate that we will get a wage increase, but difficult to say what it will be. Thank you for that, Elle. Um, that, was, that was very enlightening. Um, look, we, we might move on in the interest of time to, to questions and answers. For those that joined us late, um, we're, we're going to go through the, quest, the, the chat box um, and ask if the people that have asked questions, if they'd like to turn on their, their video and turn on their, their microphone and speak. Um, and then we can, if they have any specific questions for any of the speakers, we can take those. Otherwise, we can open it up for discussion as well. Um, just looking at what we have here, we've got a question from Catherine Silsbury. Um, Catherine, if you're still with us, if you'd like to speak to it, but your question was, I would like some discussion about the comparison between the New South Wales salaried medical awards and those in other states. We are already woefully underpaid compared with other jurisdictions, which makes this delay even more insulting. Thanks. Um, some very good comments there, Catherine. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to that or are you wanting us to continue that conversation? Um, Raj, I think Catherine's indicated she has no microphone to, she just uh, sent okay. me a message. Yep, not a but... problem. No worries at all. Um, look, I, I agree with everything you said there, Catherine, I mentioned it earlier. Um, do, do any of our presenters want to, want to comment on the impact of using a comparison with other states with our, our current conditions? Um, I know, Luke, you had, uh, you had talked to it previously. Yeah, we did do that comparison with every single enterprise agreement award across the country covering um, doctors in training and uh, New South Wales is the lowest. There is not a single state or territory that pays worse than New South Wales. They all pay more. Raj, I might just add to that as well. Um, and and what, what, what makes it worse is that it hasn't always been the case that New South Wales was the lowest. So we've seen that decline, the relative decline in New South Wales for a very key reason. And that is, there's been nine years of the wages policy in place in New South Wales, which has acted as a, ha has had a dampening effect on the wages of doctors and training, but all 
Most definitely. Thank you for those comments, Andrew. Um, I, I, I know from behalf of the doctors in training, um, we, we definitely do see that comparison talking to our colleagues in the state and hopeful that we're able to get some sort of award change moving forward. Uh, but I mean, that's a conversation for another time. Um, we've got some more comments from, from Brad. Um, Brad, I'm going to read your comment. If you're still with us, you'd like to, to comment further. Uh, why don't we tie the pay freeze into the fact that about half of the top 1500 corporations pay absolutely no tax? If we continue to highlight the fact that corporations pay very little tax or none at all, and then ask the question, why aren't they paying tax? The Liberal Party will cave in quickly. Look, I might send that one to Adam, if you wanted to comment at all. Look, uh, it's an observation that's been made a number of times. Obviously, state governments are not the recipients of income tax, or in this case, corporations tax. Um, and what business taxes there used to be have been largely abandoned. That's one of the problems with the state government's budget is it's heavily dependent on payroll tax, which is essentially a tax on employment, uh, stamp duty, which is a tax on home purchasing, and of course, a range of other measures. And of course, it's still largely dependent on largesse from the Commonwealth, including its, its uh, uneven portion of GST. So um, I don't disagree with uh, your observations, but they're not really matters that the state parliament or the state government can address, unfortunately, in my view. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that, Adam. Is there, if there's any other questions anyone would like to ask, um, please do post them in the chat. If not, um, I might provide an opportunity for any of the speakers to, to respond to anything that was uh, mentioned by the speakers after them. Um, if either, if Adam was anything else you wanted to mention at all? No, no, look, I think I've said everything that I wanted to and, and the other speakers really fleshed that out. I, you know, if I was a betting person, uh, I would think that the State Commission would probably award something. Um, the, the difficulty for the State Commission is because of the length of time the government has been in office, um, everyone apart from part-time Commissioner Stanton has been appointed by the Liberal government and the Chief Commissioner is uh, a former government employee and of course is married to a prominent Liberal MP. So this is really a test for the independence of the uh, Industrial Relations Commission, uh, no longer composed of any judges but just, uh, just commissioners. Um, only one of the commissioners has had any experience representing workers, and that's John Murphy. Uh, all the rest have just appeared for employers or worked in government. So this is a real test for them. Uh, but if I was a betting person, I think they would probably do something very similar to the Federal Commission, which I think will end up settling on 1.75. But who knows? We'll wait and see. Yeah, I agree. I also just thought I would add, um that whatever a pay increase um, is awarded may or may not be backdated. The unions put forward um, argument, but so because the government wouldn't consent to backdating, the, the unions put forward arguments about the exceptional circumstances that, that arose um, in this matter, um, which would justify the backdating of any um, pay increase awarded. So those, award, those exceptional circumstances included um, the fact that the, the PSA, the, the Public Service Association, I think first filed their application back in March or something, and then, you know, and there were 40 awards joined together um, in some interlocutory proceedings in which the union summons um, the government for, for various bits of information. The government really dug its heels in, said they needed extra time, you know, said it's impossible to pass, all these things. So, um, hopefully um, we'll get a great increase and it will be to, to 1 July. I guess there's also some speculation that it could be backdated to the 12th of August, which is when we finish the matter, or perhaps not at all. That's something else that we will await with the decision. Uh, Tony, unfortunately, I've got a bolt, but I just want to say thank you for, for having me here and I'm happy to take 
uh, any additional questions that people might think about afterwards and you might want to have forwarded to me. Okay, Adam, thank you again for attending. We, we greatly appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Adam. Um, so just to move on, um, ASMOF um, believes it's important that doctors come out against this freeze as we risk setting a dangerous precedent. Um, we also want to show our support for the broader public sector and all the professions affected by this freeze. We've launched a petition against New South Wales government to withdraw the pay cut case in the IRC to be delivered to the Premier Gladys Perjiklin and Treasurer Dominic Perrette. We have had almost 400 people sign on and we've had some great comments from doctors as to why the wage freeze is unfair. If you haven't signed this petition, please do now, and the link will just be posted in the chat. I would like you to please spread the word with your colleagues, um, because the more signatures we get on this, um, the more effective it'll be. And I'll hand back to you, Tony. Thanks, Raj. Um, and thank you all for attending tonight. I'll just move the cheat sheet over so I can look at the camera as well as read it. Um, we've had a few of these webinars. I think they've gone reasonably well. Um, we will try and have them as often as we can on topics of relevance to you, the members. And I guess we need to reflect that these are difficult times. You know, thank God, touch wood, we haven't gone down the road of Victoria. We have certainly haven't gone down the road of New York or Italy or Spain. But nevertheless, it's still important that we, uh, you know, listen to our colleagues, the public health doctors. And what's been particularly uh, interesting and I guess commendable is that the government in New South Wales has listened to Kerry Chant. I remember Kerry Chant when she had a conversation with me, should I do public health medicine or should I do medical administration training? And she chose public health training, which is interesting, and she's done very well. Um, she's probably done more for New South Wales than she's done medical admin training, but let's not reflect on that. So look, these are trying times, professionally and personally. And as your union, we are here to make sure that you get all the support you need during these difficult times. We are happy to hold local meetings at your workplace if you want. Uh, I guess for the next little while, they probably will be Zoom. So if you want a workplace meeting on this issue or on any other issue of relevance or of burning importance to you or members at your workplace, uh, get in touch with the office or get in touch with me. I still get calls from members all over the place. Um, I guess being high profile, and that's the price you pay. <laughs> so look, we will continue to keep you updated on the outcome of the case via the newsletter and social media. And it says here in the cheat sheet, please follow us if you aren't already. Now that means follow on social media. Let me be blunt, I don't do social media. I've got a Facebook page with a picture of my wife and my four children, my birth date, and that's all I put on it. And I think it was probably the right position to take if we look at what happened with Cambridge Analytica in the United States. You go online, you do stuff online, you need to be very careful. And we've actually said that in, in emails and newsletters to young doctors. Social media is a wonderful way to communicate with people, but you must be careful about it. So do follow us on social media. I won't, that's all right. I'm old and grey. So that's all from me. Um, Andrew, I guess that means we can um, push the red button, correct? We can. And, and thank you all from me and all the staff at ASMOF as well. Um, thank you for attending and we'll keep fighting for you. And good night all. Good night all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.